I'll be able to come up here on very focused trips and stuff like that. And stuff. Yeah, a little more tan. Because we're approaching that the one year anniversary, and as you reflect on all of the things that have happened in almost 12 months, what kind of sticks out to you the most? Uh, some surprises, uh, some things unfortunately that weren't surprising. Uh, what what has been surprising is the consistent overperformance of the Ukrainian armed forces and the consistent underperformance of the Russian armed forces. I had the chance to work with both the Ukrainian and, and Russian armed forces extensively, even more so with the Russians. I spent three years uh, as an attache in Moscow, and um, they were billed to be uh, a very potent military and do have some potent capabilities, but due to underlying corruption, frankly, kind of an authoritarian um, comprehension of the importance of, of human beings uh, and the inability to kind of just function coherently, they've had a disastrous campaign thus far. Uh, and any gains that they had were in the kind of a shock phase, the first couple weeks of the war, and almost everything else since has been a reversal. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, uh, I wasn't quite so, uh, as surprised as many analysts that thought that Ukraine would, would uh, buckle and fold very quickly and that this would all be over in the matter of days or weeks. Uh, that wasn't my assessment. I thought the country was too large, the, the military too well practiced at war, having been uh, fighting the Russians for eight years. But the, the, uh, their ability to handle the Russians has been pretty amazing. And um, so if those were kind of a little bit of a surprise, the, you know, the mismatch between the Russians and Ukrainians. I'm frankly a little bit less surprised about uh, the fact that the U.S. has, in a lot of ways, been a reluctant um, ally. Very, very slow, very, very uh, resistant to supporting the Ukrainians to be able to win a war um, that's not, that doesn't just serve the Ukrainian interests, but serves U.S. interests first and foremost. Uh, and that would, that kind of victory would allow the international system that's been based on this notion that, that uh, states don't attack other states to seize territory. Certainly that, that's kind of an ironclad rule in Europe uh, since World War II. Uh, it would allow the, the system to kind of to endure. And uh, right now it's still in a lot of ways too close to call with, with the Russians being able to mobilize uh, a, an industrial complex as brittle as it is. It's still enormous. Uh, there's the whole dialectic materialism uh, quantity uh, has a quality of its own. So they could just throw enough um, people behind it, behind the war effort to potentially overwhelm the Ukrainians in a long war. I think all the benefits are on the Ukrainian side in the next months, in the next, you know, year or so. But if this, if this runs really long, another couple of years, then I really get very concerned about the, the Ukrainians uh, getting overwhelmed um, by a country that's three times the size, uh, has a, a larger military uh, capacity, and has a lot, a lot of old antiquated equipment and storage that they could just throw at the, at the Ukrainians. So that's unfortunately not been so surprising that uh, we've been very, very reluctant I wrote my doctoral dissertation on this topic of U.S. policy towards Russia and Ukraine since 1991, and one of the consistent themes was favoring Russia over over other players, including Ukraine. Uh, right now, that amounts to favoring the the prospects of a normalization with Russia. That's a far-fetched notion, but there are still policymakers that think that there's a way back to some sort of normalcy, uh, as opposed to giving Ukraine the resources it needs to to preserve frankly, decades worth of investment by the U.S. into, into a system that pr allows for democracies to thrive, allows for disputes to be uh, resolved generally through kind of diplomatic means. Uh, and that is, that's unfortunately disturbing, but a consistent theme. Not just this administration, but previous administrations. This administration just happens to be living up to that kind of uh, pattern. Just as a tangent, because I want to explain that um more fully, can you just give us an insight into you as to your relationship with Ukraine at the moment? Sure. So I'm I'm a, a retired government official. Uh, I don't have any formal relationships with Ukraine. I am a. Uh, what I do have is I have the understanding of the power of civil society, 
as a private citizen what can be accomplished. So uh, me personally and like-minded other gov former government officials that believe in the, the, in the prospects of supporting Ukraine to advance U.S. national security interests have been plugging away trying to convince this administration to do more. In the days before this war started, in the days after this war started, I told the, the administration point blank, because I, I, I do the, these phone calls and Zoom calls, frankly, with the administration every couple weeks, that they, they will absolutely deliver on things that they think are red lines that they would never deliver on, whether it's tanks or more advanced capabilities, they'll get there. The question is when, how long it's going to take them. And eventually, uh, even frankly, most recently, I may have had a pointed comment to the administration when they wanted a pat on the back for tanks. Um, after finally, uh, you know, almost a year into the war, 11 months into the war, delivering, I said, you know what, guys, I feel increasingly confident that you'll provide everything and anything that the Ukrainians need. It's just going to be a matter of time. Hmm. And then I gave them a little pat on the back for, for finally getting there. <clears throat> well, uh, as you alluded, uh, there were a lot of wrong assumptions at the beginning, yeah. in February 24 last year, by many countries, including Russia. So the contours yeah. of, of the conflict in the initial stages, what have we learned since then? I mean, you kind of touched on it when you say, you know, the Biden administration's red lines and they keep exceeding them. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the conflict has changed and the U.S. administration's response to it has changed. Can you draw a conclusion sure. of where we're going? You know, it's interesting. Uh, it's not that the it's not just that the Biden administration or the you know kind of national security establishment has been slow to learn from uh, its relationship with Russia, slow to learn over the course of the previous decades before this this war became very sharp, in that uh, we continued to look the other way as Russia uh, had one transgression after another, uh, undemocratic, anti-democratic steps internally and then uh, uh, in its neighboring countries. Uh, looking to upset the, um, you know, be a spoiler in terms of uh, uh, the peaceful settlement of conflicts for for easily more than a decade, um, graduating from suppressing its internal population with the Second Je Chechen War, expropriating kind of its its uh, oligarchs, its wealthy, to attacking in Georgia, attacking a, a nearby country assassinations, multiple assassinations against opp opposition, both internally against journalists, but also against opponents outside of the country in, in uh, Germany or in Salisbury with an attempted ass assassination, interfering in U.S. elections. Consistently, we pretty much look the other way with little limited costs being imposed on Russia. Kind of breeds impunity. But Russia has also uh, been very, very slow to learn. What, what they haven't learned over the past year, which is going to, going to ultimately lead to their uh, downfall in terms of these war aims, is that they have a deep sense of chauvinism of Russian power versus Ukraine. That the Ukrainians are somehow lesser. They're not. They've proven that to, uh, to be the case. And uh, they still underestimate the Ukrainians. They still haven't really fundamentally adjusted their political aims uh, to realign with their military means. The military means every day uh, they, their capacity to wage war decreases while Ukraine's increases. There might be a tipping point at some point if the Russians th keep throwing thousands and thousands of bodies, but that's years off. Russia keeps getting weaker, Ukraine keeps getting stronger. And they haven't adjusted to that. They, they're very slow to learn. Their tactics kind of, if anything, have become less sophisticated Where with human wave assaults. Instead of trying to combine armor, infantry, air power, they're just throwing, now in the, in the city of Bakhmut, they're just throwing bodies, waves and waves of human attacks, human wave attacks. So we, they've been pretty slow to learn. The U.S. and the West have been, frankly, slightly more agile. Quickly, I think after the, uh, the, the war started, the, the democratic world coalesced with regards to sanctions, with regards to, frankly, a unity uh, of support for Ukraine, but it's not fulsome. It's not full-throated support. So that part is, is going slowly, and we can see that play out in real, in real time with uh, Germany and their deep resistance days before they changed their, their minds and provided uh, leopard tanks. Just days before they said, no, we can't do this. And the same, once we got past the tank issue, 
the same kind of rhetoric uh, unfolded with regards to planes. No planes. I mean, we'll end up probably eating our words there too pretty soon, um, especially if the situation gets very, very difficult for Ukraine. And although I, I'm pretty confident in, in Ukraine's ability to persevere and liberate territory, uh, as an analyst, you talk in probabilities. That's not the, the greater probability. But there is a less, lesser probability that somehow the Russians reform and achieve some breakthroughs. So we we can't be we can't rest on you know the, the Ukrainians' laurels. We need to help continue to arm them to to, to liberate their territory. There were several analysts who who predicted that 2023 would be somewhat of a stagnant battlefield. Um, but you mentioned mm. the uh, Germany sending the Leopard tanks and mm. now the U.S. M1 Abrams. But, you know, kind of getting back to your point that it's taken a long time to get equipment there, mm. uh, how long is the lead time to actually have them operational and sure. is it too late? So um, it's not going to be too late. It'll be too late for a shorter war. I just uh, I wrote a, a piece in Foreign Affairs laying out the case for how this war could actually end uh, more quickly and uh, in a much less risky manner for all parties, not just Russia and Ukraine, but frankly for the West and the risk of uh, escalation that spills over into a confrontation between Russia and NATO, a confrontation between a confrontation that could ultimately result in a nuclear war. That there, there's a possibility there. It's an extremely low possibility. The, the fact is that the Russians understand that it's suicidal, but it can't be dismissed out of hand. And whatever you can do to diminish that possibility even further, uh, you should do. And the, the most important thing you can do is, frankly, make sure that this isn't a long war, a war that doesn't permit Putin to kind of start to ratchet up the pressure a little bit, look for vulnerabilities, look for you know, an opportunity to conduct a cyber attack to send a warning or attack NATO infrastructure. These are things that could lead to, to a spillover. So. 2023 uh, is is now based on how these timelines for delivery of tanks and other equipment is likely to play out with the Russians conducting an offensive over the course of the next several months, uh, throwing you know pretty much everything that they have. The Ukrainians weathering that, suffering some losses in territory where we already saw some of that unfold within the past couple of weeks, but these are you know minor. Um, there are, there are some other risks that are unfolding. Like in the, in the east, in these tiny little pockets, the, the Russians can gain some ground, but at what cost? At the cost of thousands of lives. And for Russia, these are, these are not, they don't think these, of these losses as people, but it's still a finite resource. There's only so many human beings that you could throw into that fight. So eventually what you'll have is the Ukrainians weathering that storm, suffering some losses, suffering some, uh, some uh, losses in territory, and then switching to an offensive very similar to what we witnessed in Kharkiv and, and Kherson in, in September time frame. What the Ukrainians did was that they weathered those onslaughts for in, the, in the east. They gave up some territory, and then once the Russians had spent their, their available resources, they found vulnerabilities and exploited those vulnerabilities to liberate enormous swaths of territory. That's what, that's what uh, 2023 is going to look like over the course of uh, spring and summer. And what we can see is realistically, especially with this equipment coming in, uh, these, these tanks coming in, mainly the German ones, the U.S. ones are not going to uh, get there in time because they're coming off the factory floor. We did it in the slowest way possible. Um, is that you still have Ukraine accumulating sufficient, sufficient uh, fighting force to penetrate through Russia's defenses and start to liberate territories. So that's what this law, it's not going to be a static war. It's going to continue to be a mobile war with Ukraine liberating some territory and potentially uh, threatening, you know, frankly, Russia's position in, in Ukraine. Well, I was wondering um, how far are you willing to look? Do you think Ukraine can take back Crimea? So that, that's exactly what this, uh, our, uh, this my latest art, uh, article is about. Um, it's, it would be very, very hard. I could see a path to get to it. Uh, what, what Ukraine would have to, frankly, do is assemble sufficient... Um, capability, this armor, uh, air, some sort of air power, it could be suicide drones, it could be manned aircraft, it could be uh, other kinds of like drones that carry many different weapons, uh, and like a, a spear penetrate through Russia's defensive lines, and then uh, in a way that allows the Ukrainians to threaten Russia's land bridge from Russia proper to Crimea at the same time continue to attack and, and destroy the uh, Kerch Bridge. Those would be 
essential elements to the plan. I could see that unfolding through late summer. What I find hard to uh, kind of hard to believe at this point in time is that the Ukrainians will be in a position to kind of hold the battlefield in general, get to, to a position where they could threaten Crimea, then they have to cross, the, there's only really two major bridges across, and then they would have to do amphibious operations, one of the most difficult tasks that you have as a military force, uh, something crossing a sea in order to get to, to land, uh, and then having to accumulate sufficient forces to clear Crimea. That's, that's a difficult cha task. It's possible, but it's very, very difficult. What I see is potentially more challenging is this is the, probably the most dangerous portion of the war because when these forces are threatening Crimea, they're, when they're accumulated in very large numbers in order to conduct these operations, they make themselves to be extremely good targets for, for nuclear weapons. In general, nuclear weapons are not the most effective. Uh, in, in large numbers, they could be effective. But um, as one or two nuclear weapons being employed, uh, this is all kind of, we have to remember that there's a whole strategic layer of nuclear weapons. It would be disastrous. It would completely upend you know, way, the way uh, we've, the world is kind of uh, arrayed against the use of nuclear weapons ever since World War II. So that's, that's a whole different kind of question. Russia would become a pariah. Any and everybody and anybody that still talks to them, like the Indians and Chinese, w would basically isolate from them. So that's a separate question. But if let's say on the you know just very very tactical conversation, this would be the place that they would use them, where where troops are concentrated, where they could actually destroy large numbers of, of personnel and equipment. And that's that's the, the time frame that I think is you know late summer time frame where we're going to be on the horns of the dilemma. My my counsel to the U.S. government is give the Ukrainians everything they need now so that they could threaten Crimea and force Putin to negotiate. Because I think that's the one thing that he's going to want to hang on to. And there's probably a situation in which uh, the Ukrainians in the short time, in the next several months, next six months even, might be open to that possibility. At the beginning of this war, when, when the liberation of Crimea seemed like a far-fetched idea, the rhetoric from the Ukrainian side was, you know, Crimea doesn't have to be uh, liberated in the course of the war. It could play out through some sort of diplomatic negotiations. The rhetoric is shifting, where now there's a reality that Crimea might be able to be liberated by force. So the further we go down this road, the less chance that President Zelensky and the Ukrainians would be willing to be flexible when they see the prospect of liberation and ending this threat from the south, because it's, it's not just liberating territory, it's a threat that Crimea poses. There's a Black Sea fleet that continues to threaten the, uh, uh, Ukraine from the ability to launch these long-range attacks. Um, it's a vulnerability that they don't necessarily need to deal with. Uh, so it's a question of whether they're still open, open to negotiating. I guess the, the only other thing I'd mention, um, this particular scenario, I would say this particular scenario is probably a low probability that, you, that Ukraine is going to be able to liberate it. And on that basis, they would likely want to negotiate and come up with a different kind of solution. A solution that maybe to a certain extent demilitarizes Crimea, doesn't pose the same kind of military threat that it does now. And one that also incorporates the ability to conduct a broad referendum, including the people that have left, that were forced to leave Ukraine since 2014, participating in a process to determine the end state, uh, the, the final status of, of Crimea. So I, well, I was going to ask you about the prospects for peace talks, and you've kind of outlaid your, uh, your argument there, but what's your assessment of, of, of Putin's interest in, in peace talks. I mean, uh, very publicly, he's not at all interested yeah. in the military, special military operation will continue. What's your assessment of what's uh, behind this? I think the fact is that he's not interested in uh, negotiating, and uh, in a lot of ways, the rhetoric is still maximalist. Certainly about uh, uh, securing the entirety of these two areas in the Damas, Luhansk, and Donetsk that he's been fighting over for, you know, the past, what, nine years? Um, and and then the next level up would be those those entirety of the four region the four provinces that he annexed back in the spring uh so he's but that's that's kind of the lowest threshold he actually still has the higher threshold which is making ukraine a failed state and subduing ukraine entirely that rhetoric hasn't really shifted fundamentally it's like he's hedging he's saying 
well, we're going to take these four areas, but I still haven't given, given up on my plans to take over Ukraine entirely. So that we're still very, very far away from uh, our negotiations. What gets us closer to negotiations is not just uh, kind of empty words, but it's Ukraine's successes on the battlefield. If Ukraine is successful on the battlefield, destroys Russia's military capability, destroys Russia's ability to continue to wage war, that's how we get to negotiations. So the sooner that Ukraine can get there, the more likely Putin is going to negotiate in short term, in the short term. And the one place that he's going to want to negotiate for is Crimea, keeping, keeping a hold of Crimea. It wouldn't be the same way he's had it for the past 14 years, uh, for the past uh, nine years, where uh, since 2014, where you know there's a functional bridge that uh, continues to service uh, Ukraine. And now, over the past year, a land bridge, uh, most of the last year, a land bridge. I think the fact is that the Ukrainians would not allow a uh, functional bridge to operate, and the Ukrainians uh, and the Russians would have to return to what they had before 2019, before this bridge was completed, which is a ferry system. You know, ferries and barges that bring supplies over to to, uh, to uh, Crimea, and the, the Russians would have to just uh, accept that kind of those parameters. But it would allow Putin to potentially keep the, his crown jewel, which is Crimea, or at least give the possibility of this kind of negotiation. The longer this war goes, the, the smaller the possibility of of negotiations. I think until there's a a, a lot a completely lopsided victory, and again. Does Putin accept that lopsided victory and the complete liberation? If I had to, if I had to put, um, make a good guess, I would say yes, because the alternative is nuclear war, and he's not willing to risk his regime over any, any of this territory. But it's the most dangerous portion. It would be the most perilous uh, phase of the war.